Okay, it's 1 p.m. Um, California, in California uh, time, uh, Pacific time. So let's um, start. It's great to have um, Helen here with us today. Uh, Helen is a high performance computing consultant of the user engagement group at NERSC. This morning we had a presentation by Rebecca, that they are in the, in the same group. So over the years, Helen has uh, worked on a variety of um, um, computer systems uh, at NERSC. She knows a lot about parallel distributed computing, MPI, OpenMP, open and also scientific applications. It turns out that uh, many years ago, Helen and I used to be in the same group. The group was called Scientific Computing Group that was morphed into other groups later. And so today, uh, Helen will be talking about the resources that are available at NERSC, uh, what you can find online, for example, and so you can use um, the uh, hardware that's available at NERSC. And with that, Helen, please. Thank you very much, Asni, for the introduction. Uh, I'm gonna start to share my screen first. This page. I'm happy to give this class for the uh, LBNL's Computer Science Summer Student Program. Uh, my name is Helen He. I have uh, I am a con consultant at NERSC User Engagement Group. I've been giving this training classes for a couple of a few several years now, um, and starting last year, we also decided to open this class up to NERSC users that who are interested in joining to learn for relatively newer users who are interested to know more about NERSC resources. And uh, we're doing this virtually starting for a couple of years already as well. So a few of logistics uh, things first, uh, everybody is muted and you can unmute to speak. Um, I'd like you to change your name in Zoom to first name and last name. You could do it, uh, click the participants and then more next to your name to rename it. So we could, we could um, track who are in our session. And there's also a CC button that you could toggle and you can see captions on and off. And there's also a view for transcript that you could uh, see the transcript uh, real time and it will also be able to save it. Um, we're using Google Doc for question and answers instead of Zoom chat. Uh, and it's easier to not to be interleaved that we also have a record uh, offline. Uh, we'll be mostly answering these questions um, <clears throat> um, in real time instead of typing. But if we have remaining questions, we could um, forward it to other NERSC staff because I'm not an expert on everything that I'll be talking about today. Um, now we'll be posting slides and videos um, after this class. There'll be two places that one is for a training event page and the other one is the summer student page. So if you have a nurse account, we have added you to an N-Train 4 project. This is for the hands-on exercise later. If you can log in, um, it, you have to use a multi-factor authentication. So if, if you have an account, however, if you don't have an MFA set up yet, you're welcome to apply for a training account. Um, this is a link there. So the some of these information have been have been posted in the chat, and we'll be repeating some the link for Google Doc, the the how to apply for training account in the Zoom chat, so you can find those information. This is the outline of today's talk. Uh, I'm gonna very briefly the nurse and systems overview. Then I'm gonna show you a bunch of all the useful online resources that you can find about using NERSC um, systems and other um, resources. Now I'll talk about con connecting to NERSC, um, a few mechanisms. Then I'll talk about file systems and data management transfer sharing with other people. Then um, software environment and building applications. <clears throat> then uh, more detail on running jobs that will be used for, for the later hands-on. And I'll also talk about data analytics, analytics software and services. So first, uh, systems overview, nurse systems overview. Uh, many of you are summer students attending this morning's session, um, NERSC 
uh, but for other people um, who uh, didn't participate, just want to very briefly tell you that NERSC is the Mission HPC Computing Center for the DOE Office of Science. Um, <clears throat> our NERSC staff help um, to provide expertise, help for over 8,000 users and eight projects and lots of applications every year. There's a uh, different programs like um, biological environmental, basic science, nuclear science, high energy physics. Um, all these are open science and there's at NERSC. Every, this is a systems roadmap. Every three to four years, we deploy a new system. So right now on the NERSC floor is NERSC 8 Cori system. We'll be mostly using Cori for hands-on today. <clears throat> it has many core CPU. And, <clears throat> and then also Perimeter is already here. With, we are doing the integration. So users are allowed to be on the system now, but lots of, it's still a pre-production system that, <clears throat> um, and the configurations are still undergoing. So that's why uh, we'll be using Cori mostly for hands-on today. Nurse 10, um, the procurement is already underway. We have lots of um, discussions, meeting with vendors. <clears throat> and Nurse 10 should be an exascale system. This is a quick systems um, at NERSC. We have Cori and Pormother. Cori <clears throat> has over 9,000 Xeon. Uh, Phi is K now, many core nodes, and 2,000 Haswell nodes. It was once fast, uh, was, it's still number 30 on the top 500 list as of now. And, and in 2016, it was top five. And poor mother here has 1,500 NVIDIA A100 GPU nodes. And each, each GPU node has four GPUs and one Milan CPU. It also has um, <clears throat> the CPU nodes itself. And poor mother is top um, eight. Um, it's in top 500 in June, 2022. And uh, uh, last year it was number five. So we're very proud that NERSC hosts these very um, <clears throat> advanced HPC systems here that we could, um, users could do the science on them. And to the, the supporting um, <clears throat> resources like Ethernet, IB Fabric, the long-term storage HPSS, and there's uh, other services, uh, data transfer nodes, the Spain science gateways. I'll talk about a few of them um, later. So uh, second part, I'm gonna talk about online resources, lots of them. First of all, we have this classic NERSC webpage, it's www.nersc.gov. Just wanna point out a few things that you can find uh, news, that you can find science and, and publications there. And there's a uh, contact us. I think actually contact us is in, in the home or about. Um, it's not a direct page. <clears throat> there's uh, the ways that how you can talk, uh, find help with, the, the, how do you submit ticket, all these information there. And then the live status on that is um, MOTD, message of the day today, that you find status which system is up and down. There is a section for users, and then there's a NUG, NERSC user group. Uh, we have a nurse, nurse user group Slack and you find information how to join Slack over there. And most importantly, training events. So it's also under for users and then nurse training events and all the listed things there. And the one we're having now is introduction to nurse resource that on the bottom to get slow down too much. And I would like just to let you know if you haven't signed up the crash course for supercomputing next Tuesday yet, uh, please do so if you're interested. This is mainly for training people to do parallel computing with MPI and OpenMP. And it's also a hands-on event. <clears throat> and we have a NERSC YouTube channel. So all our events, training events are recorded and archived on our training on the YouTube channel. And we also have professional captions for, for them um, ordered. They're not only just training events, but also other NERSC events like data science series and lots of computer science research talks that you can find there as well. So I have tried to put um, links to every page that you could follow afterwards. 
I mentioned about user Slack. Uh, you find it from NERSC user group. Uh, it's users helping users. It's um, efficient. It's not officially sponsored by NERSC staff, but um, uh, we uh, we try we <clears throat> sometimes we would go look there and answer questions as well. Uh, if something urgent, do file a user ticket instead of relying on Slack, though. And we also have implemented things called user appointments that you can schedule an appointment with NERSC support staff and the different topics of uh, appointment you can choose. There are 30 minutes each, like GPU basics, um, using GPUs in Python, NERSC 101 is like studying um, and basic questions you can ask. <clears throat> um, the major domain for NERSC documentation is, is called NERSC docs, docs.nurse.gov. Uh, mostly these are technical documentations. And I like to point out one page called getting started. So uh, it's mostly useful for a new user that you can find links, pointers to past new user trainings, and then links to all the useful link um, pages on the docs, page, docs um, website. A few of things here, and on the left side, you can see all these bigger topics. I want some. It's the. It's all like lots of uh, high hierarchy layers, so it's not easy to find out uh, what are the information here. So the search button is extremely helpful. If you have, you want to find something, you can type it here and find relevant information. Here is uh, one thing I just want to point out. If you're very interested to find all the related many, many layers, even down the whole tree of the documentation, this is our um, staff working page, but basically the GitLab that hosts the documentation and it's open and it welcomes users to contribute um, contents as well. So here's the page make docs at YAML. And uh, I only actually copied uh, two sections here, but you can see it's very uh, detailed system parameter here, here and using parameter query. And then one section says like development and programming model, you can see all the list, detailed lists. If you want go visit that page, you can see um, the abundant um, hierarchy. IRS, uh, if you are a NERSC user, you probably have already used IRS. Um, this is the, our account management system. All the users' projects, user information, uh, your allocation, and whether you're in, enabled on which system are there in your SSH keys. You also handles a multi-factor authentication. You can check your usage info as well. It's IRIS banking or account management system. Here is a help portal, which basically you can uh, submit user tickets, open a ticket. You can check all your filed tickets and your project's tickets. Um, if <clears throat> the tickets is, is by default shared by uh, your to your projects. There's also the request forms. If you have some you know, no, needs to increase your quota, I want to make some note reservations. And there are a few more other uh, requests there as well. So this is the help portal. Another page is called My NERSC. Um, so my NERSC is sort of you should log in and then see not only things like to your um, to the list of all the jobs in the queue or all your jobs. There's a quick uh, a quick dashboard. You can see your quota, your active jobs, your completed jobs, and then you can see system up and down. <clears throat> you can find central information, central status, uh, which system is up and down, and you can find past uh, outage info, for example and the uh, links to uh, Jupyter Hub and to other useful pages. So the next page I'll show you, my NERSC actually has link to lots of other things. On the, from the left side, you can see like service tickets is just basically help portal and Jupyter Hub is how you can access Jupyter um, through the web browser. And NERSC homepage, this is actually the classical homepage uh, I showed first. Documentations portal is docs.nurse.gov technical uh, documentations. Accounts portal is Iris, so it's all here. And here is, uh, I pointed out my jobs and quota and system information. Um, <clears throat> so besides the, the main documentation page, we also have development systems or test, test bed. One of them is Cori GPU. So it's at a different location, docs.dev.nurse.gov. <clears throat> And this is a, uh, you can access GPUs on 
access query GPUs, they are sort of um, individual <clears throat> system, but uh, uses the same Slurm um, server uh, from, from Cori. So you access them by logging to Cori. I'm not going to talk much about it. Um, some of you um, during the summer may use this, but you're welcome to review this page and uh, file any tickets if you need. Also, um, in today's, uh, I'll be not talking much details about using Perimeter, but I want to point out lots of related Perimeter um, pages to you. So one of them is this Perimeter system page, and you can find the running jobs. And inside system, there's one, one link called Using Perimeter, which is super helpful. And there's an um, application to Perimeter readiness page, Red readiness page that has all the um, porting optimization. I have uh, another page to talk about uh, all the Perimeter page later. So here, here you go. Uh, Perimeter training, uh, sorry, I think I have a Perimeter page uh, at building applications where um, I have the Perimeter related page in the building and running job section. So here is the, the a quick Perimeter landing page and links to um, details and, and the readiness page. Also want to point to you lots of Perimeter training events that have um, happened. Um, <clears throat> one pretty complete using Perimeter has Perimeter system in, in an introduction, it has um, running computing uh, on Perimeter and has GPU usage programming <clears throat> models for GPU and Python, Jupyter and uh, deep learning on GPU. We have had NVIDIA HPC SDK is the uh, complete toolkit for compile and NVIDIA tools profiling. <clears throat> and lots of others. We have uh, programming with SQL, um, LLVM, OpenMP, OpenMP Offload, OpenACC, CUDA. Um, we don't have time to go over uh, the, the details of using GPU today. Also, uh, because Perimeter is under rapid involvement, so things will be um, um, finalized. Um, also, because of the limited time today, so we'll be telling you more about uh, using on Corey, but lots of knowledge is applicable to, um, to go deeper on Perimeter later on your own. Um, any questions so far, please? Let me check. Yeah, thanks, Madeline, for posting the links information here. I think I need to use another, um, Or maybe somebody can help me to read any questions on chat if there's any. I don't see any questions here yet. Uh, Q&A, yeah, if you can let's monitor. Let's see the chat, so let's see the q &A. Oh, the Google Doc, I'm sorry. No, yes, the Google permission. Box. Yeah, um, Madeline, can you open it up, please? I think you Same created that. the Q and A doc, right? No, the Google Doc. That the Q and A Google Doc. Is that what you mean? Yes, there's no no question there yet. Okay, so who says requires permission, and requests aren't being approved? Maybe it's only for nurse staff uh, or LBL. Yeah, it's possible. So Madeline, can you please check the Q&A doc to make sure it's open to everybody and with the right permission, please? I, yeah, I would, I could open it. So maybe it's for, for staff only. <clears throat> so yeah, so so if uh, Asni, you can access, can Let me okay. see. we need to make it accessible to all so that people can ask questions. Before that, if you can access it, Dude. Okay, Madeline is checking. Sorry about this. Yeah. Oh, actually, as I'm a viewer, so I cannot edit either. So. Uh, oh, okay. So, add, so can you change it to be, um, yeah. yeah, whoever can edit. So meanwhile, I'll just go on for uh, connecting to NERSC. So if you have a NERSC uh, account, uh, we are using multi factor authentication now. So you have to log in with password plus uh, OTP, which is one-time password. 
um, you can act, act, um, obtain OTP via a Google Authenticator app or OSI on desktop. Either way, it's fine. There's um, <clears throat> so the documentation is here. MFA. If you're here today, um, you if you have an account, you may already try this uh, logged in. And if not yet, um, please do apply for a uh, training account today. There's a um, SSH proxy that is that you can set up. So instead of you have to type password every single time with SSS with SSH proxy, you can you, you only need to do it every 24 hours. So it's much more convenient. Also, once you log into one nurse site, it's transferable. Like if you logged into uh, my nurse, then later on when you go to I IRS or later on when you log, need to log into Cori, it is also they're all in effective for 24 hours. So you don't need to type password for every single uh, site. You do SSH, uh, your username at cori.nurse.gov. For promoter is promoter-p1.nurse.gov or saw. Uh, saw is the promoter's first first name, saw promoter. So it's uh, saw-p1.nurse.gov. Um, that's You can do that as well. So you can username here, password, and then when, when an OTP and a set, uh, separate line. If it's a command line here, you, you type them in one single line. If you're having a NERSC training account today, OTP is not required, so you only need to type your password. And if you want to um, using visualization, X forwarding, put dash Y in your um, command line for SSH. Then after that, if you say, for example, loading a GUI, say MATLAB, and you can just open up to MATLAB. So especially for X forwarding, if you are far away from the nurse command site, it may take a long time. So we have a client service called NX, which also means no machine. <laughs> NX, so if you install NX um, on your laptop or your desktop. And then once you um, in <clears throat> launch NX, again, you need the one-time password. Uh, it's so much convenient that X seems in spontaneous, like no, no waste, no lag at all. And also it has an added benefit that if you, um, you know, internet say uh, <clears throat> suddenly uh, is, is broken you come back or you close your laptop, come back later, it's, it's it'll be at the same location as where you um, uh, last time were on. So this is a quick NX uh, session you can see. And once you're in the next session, you, without dash Y or anything, you module MATLAB, you can just open it up. And um, inside it, you can treat it as a regular terminal, regular X window as well. Then you can also access query through Jupyter and inside Jupyter, one of the kernel is called terminal. So you access Jupyter with uh, Jupyter Hub in to, to this location and, uh, and then you log in. After that, um, you can find, you can choose one of the terminals as terminal and then treat it as um, regular. Actually, we have a pretty large percentage of users not doing command line accessing, they're using um, the terminal kernel here. So I'll be talking more about uh, Jupyter a little bit later for other usage. Have, uh, have we solved the Q&A permission now? Yes. Okay, great. So feel free to add any questions there. And um, Austin, if you see something in uh, you need to answer, can please just, uh, I'll pause at each uh, section and I'll ask if there are any questions. So we'll, can, uh, sure. Wait. Thank you. Um, are there any now? Uh, no. Okay, great, thanks. So next one is uh, file systems and data management and transfer. So quickly, uh, we have many layers of different file systems. And uh, if the, the, the higher the performance, the, the lower the capacity or vice versa. So we have tape drive at the bottom is um, the <clears throat> HPSS. It's data is there forever. Uh, 
um, then community file system. <clears throat> it's also permanent and it's uh, we um, use, usually it's for uh, those projects, project members to share files and it's pretty large uh, in uh, quota as well. Then you have the scratch. We have the query scratch and permanent scratch. These are um, temporary because they are subject to purge, but they're much faster and large uh, for IO usage. Uh, the burst buffer is um, sort of on, on the node on Cori, but uh, it's, temp it's also temporary for job. Um, and right now the proper burst buffer support is being reduced, so I'm not um, uh, talking more about it. Uh, we, we had lots of uh, discussion last year on how to use it, but uh, this year we're gonna let it go. Here uh, we talk about you have global home, you, lo you log in, you get landed on global home and your project has the global community file system. Um, I, global home is really small. Um, it's only up to 40 gigabytes per user. It's usually for you to, you know, for your relative small scripts and some um, like read me or it's not um, tuned for perform for payroll jobs and we do not change your quota. Um, for community file systems, it's mounted on all platforms. So it's as, as, as well as global home. So you can access them on different uh, NERSC systems. It's median performance um, as compared to Scratch. So Scratch is um, rec recommended for most of your parallel, large parallel jobs. As I mentioned here, however, it has a 12 weeks policy, uh, a purge policy. So make sure you um, save your data um, to either project directory or um, the long-term HPSS archive. And we'll be doing some of the tests here today in Scratch. And this is uh, HPSS, everyone has access to it. And you would use the HSI or HTAR. If you have you know, you're accessing it from any of the NERS systems, these uh, utilities have already been in, uh, installed for you. You can just directly um, archive, uh, but also you can you could install HS, HSI and HTAR clients on your local systems and find out how to install them. <coughs> so that you could um, back up your local, local data to HPSS as well. Or sometimes if you're from, you're uh, not only a NERSC user, you could be an Oak Ridge user. And then there's also Oak Ridge, uh, you can have HSI HTAR uh, utility there. All right, um, so next section is software environment and building applications. So on NERSC, um, both of the <clears throat> Cori and Perlmutter are Cray or HPE systems. Um, the OS is a version of Linux, especially on the compute nodes. And we have uh, compilers on different systems, multiple, multiple um, variants. We have different di multiple compilers <laughs> on each system. And um, on NERSC staff provide lots of libraries that you can use um, directly instead of have to build by, by yourself. We also have lots of uh, ready built application binaries like VASP, like uh, LAMPs that users can also run. We have uh, a quick big set of software stack called by extra, extra scale um, computing. Um, <laughs> E4, I forgot the abbreviation for that it's called oh, here it's here extreme scale scientific computing <laughs> software stack 4s there's a 4s here and um, there's also lots of the tools compilers libraries um, under the e4s uh, package the all these uh, lots of the compilers or softwares are supported in the modules environment on um, Cori, it's the Tico module. On um, Perlmutter, it's the LMOD. They're very similar. So you log in, you do a module list. You can see the list of modules in your environment. There will be a default set 
installed for you or loaded for you. I'll show it in the next slide. And you can find which module is available. Do module avail to find um, like module avail that CDF or and you can load a module, unload a module, load a module to use. You could use module show or module display to see what a module, what, what this module is about, what does it set, what does it set some path that is set to some libraries, binary. Um, and you could module swap between something like Haswell architecture to KNL architecture. I'll tell you what these are uh, needed for our next um, exercise. And module help give you some help about what module is as well. So here's a quick list on query logging. If you log into query, this is and you to immediately do a module list. You see like 22 modules are already loaded for you by default. Some of them are like lower level things users do not care much about. But I try to highlight a few like Intel here is the compiler. It's loaded for you. Intel is our default compiler on query. And it loads the Cray scientific libraries. It has like LA pack, scalar pack, some of the mass libraries that you can use, link to. And the program environment Intel. So program right Intel has um, underneath is a big umbrella module that it, it would load the Intel library, the Crayla Lips scientific library. It'll load the MPI library here. This 21 is Cray and Pitch, but it's like, um, it's the Intel compiler built uh, MPI library. So if you switch the program environment Intel to say program environment uh, GNU, then looks like the Cray and Pitch is still loaded, but it changes to the GNU compiler built MPI. Same for the uh, scientific library as well. So it's like pretty modularized and uh, transparent for users to switch between different compiler environment. And all this, the, the things you see will be very similar, on the, but using a different mechanism of module, uh, it's called LMOD on parameter. So you want to say um, that when you build applications on Cori, because we have two different types of compute nodes, there's a um, Haswell compute node, there's a Kana compute node. So we are, and, and our logging nodes are Haswell. So when you try to build application to run on KNL compute nodes, we are doing cross compile. So um, you, that the, the KNL binary won't run on Haswell compute nodes because the architecture is different. Um, Haswell app binary can run on KNL, Haswell um, binaries built on Haswell compute nodes can run on KNL compute nodes nodes, but they are not optimized because you're not taking advantage of, of the KNR uh, node architecture. And also, um, Cori binaries are not compatible to parameter binary. Um, parameter also has CPU and GPU, so there are different ways of, of building. So make sure you do uh, binaries, uh, build the applications differently and separately for each architecture. I'll tell you a little bit uh, how do you build for um, different compiler and different um, programming languages codes. So um, normal, if you're familiar with some Linux systems, you're probably using um, any compiler. For example, if you use um, Intel compiler, you would be using um, i4 for Fortran, ICC for uh, C code, uh, and I. But um, for for the the, the HP system, Scori and, and, and Parameter, we actually have something called compiler wrappers. The wrappers are FTN for Fortran codes, uh, little cc for, capital, uh, for C codes, and capital CC for C++ codes. So whether you're using different compilers, you'll always be, always, always be using the, the same uh, compiler wrapper. But underneath, it'll invoke different, uh, we call native compilers. So if you're under Intel, it'll invoke i4 for Fortran. If you're using GNU compiler environment, uh, it will actually invoke g Fortran uh, when you're using the wrapper. The wrapper has this advantage that it also links necessary libraries, such as uh, MPI libraries or li scientific um, libraries. So uh, we have some test codes here today. You will be uh, using compilers. 
the wrappers also know where the include files are. <laughs> so um, a little um, sample example script here is a byte test code for Chen you with FTN and dash O and my test. Now you want to use Cray compiler, you would module swap program environment Intel to program environment Cray and then exact same FTN com um, command. On KNL, so by default, again, it's still Intel compiler. Now you have to swap something. It's, this is the architecture. The, the module CrayPE Haswell is loaded by default. Tar default target architecture is Haswell. But if you want to build to run on the Cori KNL uh, compute node, you need to module swap CrayPE Haswell to CrayPE Mike KNL. And then use the same um, wrapper to, to do the build. And then if you want to use Cray compiler to build an application to run on KNL, you would module swap PRG ENV first and then swap the architecture, then use the same wrapper to build. Um, so this is about um, Perl model. I'm not showing exactly how to how you do it. So building for Perl model on CPU is pretty similar to Cori. Uh, it's loaded by default is the, um, there's a Milan node uh, architecture loaded as default. And the um, we have the GNU compiler as default. But other than that, it's very similar. There's also a PRG ENV GNU uh, loaded by default for you. Uh, for the building on GPU, uh, it's much more complicated. You have to, you still be building on the logging nodes, but you have to, there are different flags for different compilers, uh, different programming models, OpenMP, OpenACC, CUDA, and different um, flags to use for different compilers as well, that to, to make sure you're targeting the GPU nodes. But this link, um, you, you can find much more information there, compiling, building software, per model. We also have, I mentioned that uh, we have this uh, GPU on parameter readiness page. Uh, it's under performance category and then readiness have, this is a very, very long single page that has sections on GPU concepts, different programming considerations, programming models, running jobs, machine learning, libraries, IO, and even lots of case studies there. So it's a, this, the, those, um, this is like when we were accumulating knowledge by ourselves. We have a NERSC and NISAP team that uh, especially focused on porting and getting uh, user applications ready on Perlmutter. So this is the page that uh, put down our best practices and knowledges that we, we learned on, along this road. All right, before I do the running job section, any questions so far? Mm, I don't see any, Alan. Uh, okay. Yeah, I think uh, we'll be doing this uh, at hands on, probably we have more questions. <laughs> uh, running jobs. So, NERSC, uh, most jobs are parallel. We have um, people using small nodes, number of nodes, you know, all the way to the capacity, the, like the full system. And we also have lots, lots of serial jobs, especially for doing now um, HPC uh, data simulation, <clears throat> data analysis, data, we call data intensive um, workload that many, it could be uh, a big bundle of lots of lots of serial jobs, but could be um, tens of thousands of those in, in one um, set. And so we have a batch scheduler, it's called Slurm. And it's not first thing first out. We have lots. Uh, we have queue policies uh, to be try to be fair, and try to have uh, maximum utilization of, of the system. So we have two types of nodes: uh, logging nodes. You would use uh, to edit your files, compile, and submit your jobs. Could run very very short serial utility. Serial utilities, not um, parallel jobs. There do not run production jobs on logging nodes as well. And the compute nodes is dedicated resource, right? So here's a little uh, diagram. On the logging node, um, 
you log in and you would use command either as batch or as, as alloc to um, submit your job to request compute node reservation, uh, compute node allocation. And once you are gain allocation, you'll be landed on the head compute node. It's also one of the type of compute node that you asked for. And on that, you would run all these, you know, um, typical commands inside your bash script, like ls, a cd to somewhere, and copy a file, all those things. Um, there'll be, you'll be running serially, sequentially on the, the head compute node. And at one point, because you add, when you do ask for allocation, you ask, actually ask for um, a number of nodes or for a parallel job. So you would use srun to launch your parallel job. And with this srun, you will be distributing your um, workload onto the multiple nodes that, um, that you asked for. <clears throat> so I'll show you a quick, uh, my first Hello World program in the batch script. With Slurm, you have all sorts of um, S batch keywords and asking for different uh, resources. So I'll explain whether these are in the next few slides. But you have a script you prepared for, say my batch script. And then on the login, though, you would S batch my batch script contains of the uh, bash shebang and um, the S batch Slurm batch script uh, flags and your uh, SRAM command to do um, 64. 64 MPI tasks of running this hello world example. You could also run uh, interactive instead of as batch, you could say as alloc, and then you would wait for your session prompt. Inside as alloc, you do similar flags to asking for how many nodes, what queue you want to be, and interactive batch usually you would do dash queue uh, interactive. You're asking for has one nodes for 10 minutes, and you would wait for the prompt, and then once it's coming back, you would type as long and then and you will see your output on, in the uh, terminal session as well. This is called interactive batch. But again, for the, for the batch script, so here dash capital N is asking for how many nodes you want 40 nodes for this, for this um, uh, request. And on nurse on the Corey Haswell, there are 30, um, 34 physical cores, and but there are log 64 logical cores because each physical core has two uh, logical CPUs. So each um, Haswell node has 64 logical cores. And when you ask for 40, um, here actually I'm doing little n is ask, is doing how many MPI tasks per <clears throat> for, for this um, job. So um, if you're not familiar with MPI OpenMP, don't worry yet. Um, I think the next Tuesday's class will tell you uh, what they are, how do you programming MPI and OpenMP for the parallel jobs. And um, for now, it's just, um, we're talking about how to run these jobs. Um, you don't have to, to know much details of, um, of the language itself, but basically MPI tasks is, so you have a big application, it's too big to run on a single node uh, or a single uh, physical course. So you would distrib distribute, distribute your uh, application onto different and multiple um, physical cores. And in the MPI world, it's called uh, how many MPI tasks I have to do my job. So here you have um, 40 nodes and we have 32 MPI tasks we could run 32 MPI tasks per node. If we do that, then we will be running a total of 1,280 MPI tasks. And the, these dash C and dash CPU bind is, is, is critical to so that your, your process binding to the physical cores are even and not wasted, not overlapping, so that they can be optimal. So it will tell you how to specify this number of the, uh, the C here. Um, in the previous example, um, we're doing 32 tasks per node that um, then because we have a total of 64 CPUs per node, then each task will have two logical cores to it. This is the two coming from. Then the, the 32 tasks times two will be fully occupy these 
the node of 60, 64 logical CPUs on the Haswell node. And then um, I mentioned about MPI tasks. Then if an MPI task using asking for multiple, multiple cores, then underneath each MPI tasks, you can invoke, you can um, and create multiple M uh, OpenMP threads. So it's a different combination of MPI and OpenMP programming model. Then in this case, um, like I'm again asking for uh, 40 nodes, but I am only running uh, 160 total MPI tasks, which means I'm running four MPI tasks per node. Then on the node of six, we have 64 logical cores total so that each MPI task will be using 16 logical cores. So here you have to specify 16. And again, to do CPU bind equals cores to make sure you're getting uh, the best. Um, it's called process and thread affinity, basically binding your MPI tasks, binding your open MP threads to the physical cores um, optimally, not overlapping, not underutilization. <clears throat> So that the cores won't um, won't have to, you know, split their memory or their uh, CPU resources among different tasks. And then once when when you're using OpenMP threads, you can uh, specify a few of OpenMP uh, environment variables to bind further bind your OpenMP threads. So you would bind prox you want process bind to set yes, and where do you want put your own P. Um, threads to the cores or to the threads. And here, because I'm running four MPI tasks per node and I'm, I came on eight threads per MPI task. This is for how many uh, open MP threads per MPI task. Again, it's probably, if you don't know MPI OpenMP yet, um, you will get this knowledge next Tuesday, but lots of NERSC new users, they are not necessarily, they are pretty advanced in programming um, uh, models. They're just new to NERSC resources. So here is the, the big template uh, this is used for, for running jobs here. And I want to mention that we use Slurm here and the way we um, binding do the up thread affinity is uh, sort of unique that we use these flags. It could be different in different um, HPC centers. <clears throat> and we have a, a page on affinity to tell you how do you set um, dash C here. For, uh, for Corey Haswell, there are 64 total logical nodes. And for Perlmutter CPU, the total is two, uh, 256. Again, it's also two sockets um, Perlmutter CPU, but it's, it's quite similar to do the affinity uh, as compared to the Corey Haswell. So this is the page here. I mentioned jobs affinity. It tells it all, it, all has, it has formulas how to calculate the C values here and that uh, and also gives a definition. The process affinity is bind MPI tasks to CPUs. The thread affinity is bind threads to CPUs the, to those CPUs that have been allocated to the its parent MPI process. And then there's also um, the topics of affinity here, the memory affinity because uh, for example, on Corey Haswell, there are two sockets, and then the, uh, each socket is one NUMA domain, meaning the memory access from the cores on this NUMA domain, um, access to its local cores is faster uh, memory. But if it's it needs to access memory on the remote NUMA domain, it takes much longer um, time. So you want to bind your affinity, bind your process thread uh, to its local, local NUMA domain. So they're all, these are all being explained in the affinity uh, page. We will actually be doing one exercise um, on this. Here is quick um, diagram. So on socket on Haswell, um, the two sockets, socket one and socket zero and one, I would like you to um, pay attention to these numbers here. So there are 32 physical cores. These are black numbers. So each core actually has a number. So zero to 15 is on the first socket and 16 to 31 is the second socket. Each core, each physical core here, this is a physical core. It actually has two numbers to it. One is like physical core zero also has a 32 number to it. 32 is, it is its logical core. 
So if uh, in one of the exercise, you know, print uh, each of my OpenMP slash open uh, MPI slash OpenMP thread binds to which core, it actually binds. It reports you I'm binding to the numbers. So if you know the number, you know which if your binding is uh, as expected. So uh, the new, the whole thing here is the top is the new one new domain. It has cores zero to fifteen plus thirty two to forty seven, and the bottom one has a cores sixteen to thirty one plus forty eight and sixty three. There are a few ways to check. You know how do, how do I know these are the, my um, numbers the, and and the um, the number of sockets, number of numa domain, these are the commands to find out. Numa control dash hardware information. So I'll tell you on the compute node. Then um, on, has, on the Kenya node, it actually has, we are doing this quad cache mode. Kenya node has more other modes, but um, by default, we have, we have set everything to quad cache. In this mode, there's only one numa domain. And on the KNL node, we have 68 total of physical cores. They are numbered from zero to 67. But then each of these have four hyper threads and then they are um, associated with different um, numbers to them. And then these are logical core numbers. So physical core zero has logical core zero, 68, 136, and 204, all the way to here. <clears throat> So uh, when we do the um, affinity exercise later, you also be trying to coming back and compare with this uh, slide to see if I'm binding my course. Like if I want have 64 um, MPI, uh, have 16 MPI attacks, I would like to have the first four MPI attacks binding to these numbers. And if I have four threads uh, each for these MPI attacks, I would like my first thread to be associated with these numbers cores, and my second uh, OpenMP uh, threads being associated with these, right? So understanding these numbers is, is useful. Here is our example script to run on KNL nodes. So as I said, we have a total of 68 cores, but what if I'm running here, I'm running 64 um, MPI tasks here, then, um, each MPI task will have will be on one physical core each. Then each one has four logical cores. Um, that's what you set the dash C for. And you know, again, to set all these OpenMP uh, variables. With that, with these setting, you get very clean. Like I said, MPI rank zero will be on core physical core zero. MPI rank one will be on core one. And when you Print the affinity, and I'll tell you rank zero has these four numbers. Rank one has these four. And then also we are printing the thread numbers. Thread zero, one, two, each will be on one. You, you see I uh, color coded. Thread zero is of MPI rank zero will be here. Thread zero of MPI rank one will be here. <clears throat> on on KNL nodes, sometimes because you have 64 total nodes, and if you say you want run run 16 MPI tasks, uh, you'll be will be actually on purposely not to use these four because otherwise they won't be distributed evenly. You don't want um, <clears throat> uh, some of the MPI tasks being on like because if a total of 272 logical cores divided by 17, it's 17 is actually happen to be divisible by, by 30, it won't be divisible. So it would um, for, for purposely waste these four cores and then normally people running MPI tasks in the power of two, most people do that. Um, I've mentioned uh, using S alloc. So S alloc was the, have two ways of running it. One is um, debug. One is interactive. The diff these are just different limits that we have for, for the jobs. Debug queue have, can run up to 30 minutes. <clears throat> and then you can have a pretty big number of nodes um, allowed. For the interactive queue, um, you have much longer time limits. You can run up to four hours, but only up to 64 nodes total of your project. 
And then this also has a good um, advantage that if you either wait for six minutes, get a note, or it tells you I don't have enough note for you. So this is highly recommended if you want to do a quick turnaround to debug to your applications instead of um, doing as batch submitting your job in the queue and you don't know when you have uh, the res uh, results back. Um, again, lots of links here. Helen, there are two questions. All right. Should I read them? Yes, please. Okay, what is the difference between batch script and interactive? So batch is, um, you prepare a batch script, like um, script I've showed somewhere. Uh, this is a batch script. You give it a name and then you ask batch. Then your job is sitting in a queue. You wait for it. Um, you don't have interactive access to it. So you, you can put in some of the things in, you know, mail you when job is done, or you can constantly check in your job directory to see if it, it has it has been run. There's also a few commands you can uh, check the check the monitor the queue. I'll show you in a slide. So that's as batch uh, in batch in a batch queue uh, running the batch queue. Then the interactive batch is the interactive means you have interactive response to your job. You have interact. You can have interaction with your job. What you do is on the terminal logging node, uh, you do as alloc instead of as batch, and you wait for it. Like for example, if you do an interact, you usually wait up to six minutes. Either you quickly get your node, and then you will be on your logging on your head compute node, and then inside it you can do interactive uh, batch. Running, you can do S run to do you know parallel job parallel run because here you ask for two nodes, and then you have a session of two nodes. You'll be on a head compute node. You can run multiple batch jobs in it interactively, and you get your results immediately on your terminal. So these are called interactive batch using S alloc, and the S batch is regular batch. Next question, Helen, <laughs> that's a good one. How do you know how many cores do you, you will need? <laughs> how do you know how many cores you would need? That really depends on your application. You would start from small and small input size. Okay? And then um, <clears throat> sometimes if you use too few nodes, you may be you know, over the memory limit, you get stack fault, and you also get um, memory limit uh, you, you would actually get an error message of memory um, exceeded. But um, otherwise you want, um, it, it's code of, of balance, how many tasks you want, MPI tasks you want to use. And um, sometimes using too many MPI tasks, it'll actually decrease your performance because you have, there's a lots of overhead of messaging, passing each other to, to communicate. So depending on your problem size, you will find your uh, sweet spot, we say that, uh, how many MPI tasks and how many open MP threads. And then based on that, um, you can usually uh, fully occupy your node. Then based on how many MPI tasks, you would decide how many nodes, right? Or maybe ask uh, some of your colleagues for their similar applications, similar um, input size, how many nodes do they use? There is another, would you take another question now? Ellen? Sure. Yes. Okay. So I have an application similar to Jupyter that has a GUI exposed over a port. How do I access this application GUI? It, uh, it must run on a computer node only. Is it yeah. possible to open a port in this? <laughs> computer node only GUI that's um, on the S alloc interactive batch, you will be able to access it, GUI. So there's a, for example, there are a lots of uh, compute node access GUI like um, debuggers, right? You have to run on a on a compute node. There are a few of the um, uh, visualization tools that you want to do it, uh, and and also do uh, has the, the GUI. So as alloc is your friend, I have interactive batch. Right, can I go on? Oh, no, yes, you can continue. Okay, I'll continue. So I did just say as alloc is interact batch. I was just to tell a few of the um, different ways of running jobs. So I, as I mentioned, 
there are probably many, many serial jobs you want to run, and you do not want to waste a whole compute node that has 32 cores in it. Um, by default, our, our queues are exclusive, meaning if you ask for it, it's all yours. And whether you use the whole node 32 cores or you use one core, you'll be charged by the whole node. So we um, develop, implemented the shared QoS allows multiple people, multiple jobs to run on the same node. So you can run a small uh, a serial job to use single core, or you can run a very small parallel job using a few cores um, to just submit to this queue shared and you will only be charged a fraction of the node. Um, you can also bundle your jobs. The bundle jobs is like, <clears throat> you can bundle them sequentially. For example, you ask for 100 nodes and I told you, you can use S1 to launch a job, but if you want run three um, executables, you can run them um, sequentially, but then ask for a total number, a total amount of the, what time needed for each one of them. Um, you can do it in a batch job like this or in as alloc um, interactive batch session. Once you get your compute node allocated, you can run one after another uh, in the interactive session, of course, like this. And you can also bundle your jobs simultane simultaneously, meaning uh, you have three S1 here, three basically parallel jobs, and you can run if it say one of them as needs two nodes, another one needs five. So in this case, you can run them simultaneously if you ask for total number of nodes needed for each. But make sure you put an ampersand and a weight in here. Otherwise, <clears throat> one if one of them finish, if they were um, the whole job will fail without waiting for other jobs to finish. Then sometimes you need to do some dependency jobs. Like um, my second job needs to wait for the first job to make sure it's succeeded. So you can do dependency inside. You can, this is job to job script. You can put a um, dependency after okay of your first job ID, for example. <laughs> and then, or you could say after any means, as long as the first job finished, I, I will launch my job too. The first one after OK means as long as first job succeeded, I launched my job too. Um, you can do it in the command line. You can also do it in your job script. You added this here. So you first submit first job and you get a job ID, right? And then you put a job ID here in your job script for your second job. This is a called dependency jobs. There are, um, uh, some of the workflows, for example, climate models definitely uh, needed these dependency chains. There's also something called job arrays. Uh, you have many, many similar jobs and you, it's, <clears throat> they, the, the job arrays allows you to man manage them much easier than individual jobs because it gives you, give you a, a slum array job ID and using this three job ID, you can manage, you know, similar sets of input files in different um, say subdirectories. Then so you can just, um, it's, and, and then these job IDs uh, um, array there um, in the system, you can view them as one job to um, like a monitor or cancel, but as long as they're submitted in the batch queue, they are allocated individually. So in, so if you submit 10 jobs, it could be running one after another, they, they won't be run um, all scheduled simultaneously. <clears throat> so it's sort of um, array job is doing uh, man managing your uh, workflow, right? So we do have some other workflow tools. I'm um, just giving you one example here. Uh, it's called um, in the next slide will be GNU Parallel. But basically what we want to tell you is that do not do SRAM, um, one node, one core, my job, and then do a big loop. When you do that, it'll overwhelm the batch scheduler and it's very, very inefficient. It could kill other people's whole um, <laughs> slurm session. So the, the parallel, GNU parallel is a module load parallel. And on a logging node, you could say parallel dash J like in a sequence of one to five, and then I'll launch five uh, jobs. So this is very easy, very small overhead. It's even better than task arrays. So um, 
check out uh, the, the workflow page. There are many, many tools um, for you to uh, manage your workflow, um, whether it's sequential or small parallel jobs. Uh, we do have a job script generator to help you to put in some of your requirements, what nodes you want to run on, what, what, um, you, how many, um, how many nodes, what, uh, how long is the wall clock time, et cetera. And then it, how many tasks, MPI, MPI tasks, open MP threads. And I'll give you a, a template here. You can, man, you can make some changes. You can add to some more flags to it. And you know, I'll do adding some uh, scripts here to pre and post processing, etc. But this is a template, so it's on my nurse page, and um, in the job section, job script generator. It also has a parameter uh, job script generator as well there. Uh, monitoring. So I I mentioned an S batch submit a job. You don't know when you this job is finished, but we have a few commands you can use. SQ is a Slurm native command, and we also have SQS, it's NERSC uh, custom wrapper script. Without typing anything, it gives you your jobs in the queue. Uh, if you push a dash capital A, it gives you every other, every user's jobs in the queue. And you can have another flags like dash T capital R gives you all running jobs, for example. And there's also an S account is to query the completed and pending jobs in the Slurm database. Slurm jobs database. We also have a monitoring. Um, uh, this is a documentation of, of these, uh, how do you monitor pages, jobs. You could cancel your job. You could um, update your war time, update uh, some of the other flags for your jobs in the queue. So this is the um, page you wanna check it out. On the web, uh, my.nurse.gov, my you can see all the queues, queue backlogs. And we also have some statistic data, heat maps of the queue wait time. So for example, um, like a job asking for two nodes for 24 hours usually. For the past job, past months, what is the his historical average wait time? Um, <clears throat> and you can see uh, live status, the queue look here as well in the, I think, Okay, yeah, this is this live stat is not QLOC. This is the MOTD. Um, okay, uh, just in a quick example here, the queue policies. So we have lots of queues. Uh, it's called QoS. Is you when you request what type of nodes, what type of service you want. By default, it's debug if you don't say anything. Um, but most people have to use regular because it gives you much more longer or time. And the debugs only give you half an hour, right? Also, the max number of nodes is much higher than debug. But then if you want quicker turnaround, it charges twice, there's a premium QoS. And your PI has to approve you to access uh, premium. There are uh, the flex QoS, you can request um, minimum wall time, uh, regular wall time, and then a minimum wall time that your job can be killed. But you, if your job has checkpoint restart built in using flux, uh, it's much charging is uh, half. And also since you have asked for a minimum war time, your job is much easier to be scheduled. There's a real time you have to get uh, approval for, but your it's uh, a, a few set of uh, nurse applications that they need real time experimental data analysis, for example. So this is uh, under special um, approval. Interactive, I already mentioned, um, usually for S alloc uh, interactive batch. Mm. So some considerations running jobs. <clears throat> I mentioned running jobs on parameter CPU is similar to running on Cori Haswell, especially regarding to affinity settings. Uh, running jobs on GPU um, is much more complicated. Um, the, the, the settings, um, flags of tax GPUs per task, ta number of tasks per node. And then there's a GPU binding flags as well. And there's a few of the uh, CUDA MPI aware, there's a special environment variable settings. So we're not talking about this today, but the, the link is here. Um, compile separately, please. Also do not run from global homes because IO is not optimized. Use Scratch for most of your big runs and consider to use shifter 
for large jobs that using shared libraries. I'll talk about Shifter um, in the data analytics uh, section. Okay, so before that, um, any question um, more about running jobs, please? I don't see any. Okay, so we'll be talking about uh, the this section before we do the hands-on. Um, data analytics software and services. This is a quick, <clears throat> this is about Cori's data feature. So when Cori was um, deployed, we, we want this to be um, serving traditional high performance computing plus data intensive applications. So we have um, adopted lots of, of data friendly features. So we have a large, um, uh, memory logging nodes. Uh, we have uh, implemented Jupyter Notebook. And I mentioned serial queue that you can have a shared node to do uh, to share uh, a single node. We have a real time queue for experiments, especially. We have a lots of uh, workflow management um, tools, and then also they, they will be running on the workflow nodes. Yeah, I didn't mention it specifically, but we have uh, two types of big mem nodes. We have on the Haswell big mem nodes, and we also have an external um, large memory nodes that was um, added last year. Uh, I'll be talking about Docker, uh, containerized environments. The, it's also data friendly. Um, there, you can compute nodes can have access to outside world and can streaming data to compute nodes, uh, database access, et cetera. We have interactive queues here and the data warp is for IO acceleration. So here are the uh, list of sort of uh, software stack data related. Uh, data transfer access, I'll be talking about Globus online. And this is Jupyter. And this I this this is no machine, not a machine. This this is an X <laughs> for the quick um, X uh, X window um, acceleration. We have Python and Newt and lots of workflows. I talked about the new parallel, but there are you know Parcel, uh, Paper Mill, Fireworks, Task Farmer is um, implement and uh, developed by a nurse staff. Um, data management, we have HTF, NetCDF, root, and different types databases that you can you can a user can request for MongoDB, MySQL, Postgres, SQL, and we have lots of data analytics and machine learning, uh, deep learning frameworks. We have Python, R, Spark, Julia, MATLAB, Mathematica, TensorFlow, Kara, PyTorch and the data visualization, visit Paraview. So I'm not gonna talk about a few of these uh, in a little bit more detail. <clears throat> so this is the list here for Globus Online. So what is this for is for move data between um, different endpoints. The endpoints are mostly available on the for the um, ESnet or big uh, data network, it's in many um, big HPC centers in um, US and, and Euro uh, Europe around the world. So globus.org, you um, create an account, you, you, can log, you can log in with your NERSC um, password and MFA. And the good thing is that you can find a, a endpoints that's already being set up. For example, there's a NERSC DTN endpoint. DTN is our dedicated data transfer system, data transfer node. There's a endpoints for NERSC query, NERSC parameter, NERSC HPSS. Once you, act and you are in this endpoint, the files on the system will be listed. So if you um, transferring data from two data points, when say the other one is, for example, is um, the, <clears throat> the OSCF uh, one at the endpoint, then you can transfer data in between. We can archive from Cori to HPSS. 
You can also create a Globus Connect personal. So create a, you can set up a, your laptop um, endpoint. Then with, then you could have, you could easily move data between your laptop to our nurse systems. Um, so I have one for myself, it's called Helen's laptop. Um, these are the documentations here. This is a quick uh, file manager. Once you're in there, you can find uh, one endpoint here, another endpoint here, and you once you log in and you see your, your you know, data. And then you can click one day, one file here and then click start from this direction. Or if I click file here, use this start and I'll move data the, the following the, the direction of your arrow. The the good thing is that it's it's it does it in parallel. It does it. Um, uh, it is a fork torrent, meaning if it just got disconnected, it'll pick up uh, afterwards. It will retry by itself, and it'll send you an email once it's it's done. Um, so data transfer tips: basically, use Globus for large automated uh, monitor transfers. You can still do smaller, you know, CPS, CPU, or sync went for one time or smaller ones, but Globus is still good, also good for small trans files as well. And then in between those users, between those users, we have a little utility called give and take. So you can give somebody else in your file, and then that person will receive an email with a link, and then that person could do take dash you from the sending person and that file name very easily. Um, so if you want to have some you know, external collaborators, how do you share data for them, with them? We have uh, a few things. One is the web portal. So every single project has a project directory called global CFS. It's in the community file system and cedars slash your project name, usually M something M2345. You could create a www directory there. And then in there, you could be indexed HTML or all the other things that you want to uh, publish. Then these are just being just instantly available with this at this URL, http portal.nurse.gov slash CFS slash your project. But if you want to do something more fancy, um, like you want some other users can access your data, also be able to do some, you know, post-processing, downloading a subset of your input, doing some, <clears throat> even some um, analysis of your data. You can set up uh, science gateways and those are done by uh, made within the Spring service. So there's a Spring service. Um, in order to use this, it's, you have to attend a Spring workshop. We are offering multiple times a workshop per year can easily sign up for one and uh, have the, the trainings and then uh, staff will work one-on-one -on -one with you, make sure your science gateways are set up. <clears throat> Shifter. <clears throat> so Shifter is sort of a Docker-like functionality. Basically what we want is because some of the applications, they want their own set of environment and it's very hard to um, adopt um, them to bring everything they need or that on our um, query or parameter system, they may have different operating system. They may have a different compli complicated set of software they need. So for those, you can create um, a Docker image. And so that these users then just bring along and um, to, <clears throat> to run our systems. So, the uh, um, with Docker, the problem is the Docker image. Um, to create a Docker image, you need to have um, root access. So we can do that. Uh, the way we have is a sort of um, um, a little bit um, mod modified, and we have a nurse has a shifter thing here. So for Docker, you still create an image. It's very similar to how you create it. Um, and from whatever um, OS, you do all these um, ways of <clears throat> you could run um, update packages, install dependencies, and then you build it. You have, you, and then you actually made a, a Docker. Right? After that, 
with, with this uh, Docker file, you could build an uh, image and then you would push on to the public Docker image, uh, Docker, Docker registry. Um, that's become public. But if you have a preference of make it um, private, the way you can do it is you could push it to our NERSC shifter registry. Once you have this shifter registry um, inside NERSC, once you have this, this shifter image inside NERSC registry, you can use it um, using um, integrated with Slurm commands. Then you ask batch, just add one line, that's just image equals your na image name. And then you would load the shifter module. And then to run your application, you just add shifter in front of the application executable, executable name. So this is very convenient <clears throat> to have your custom user environment. Um, this is one example. It also helps, uh, I think in the running jobs last bullet, what I mentioned is that if you have a large you have a job uses large number of shared libraries, this is often the case for Python applications has lots of like Python paths, the libraries is in many, many different directories. So once you create a shifter image for a Python executable um, and libraries, you bring them all in advance into the image, then when you uh, pull, pull the image to the compute nodes, they are available immediately instead of you have to load image, um, the, the shared libraries on the compute node. That would usually add a huge um, overhead. So here is a quick example. If you run uh, one of the Pynamic example with, especially when the, the ranks, number of ranks are high, the time pulling the dy dy dynamic libraries into the computer is much higher. So using shifter versus using scratch, this is the time, the startup time. Uh, it's, it's, it's only about uh, a quarter of time versus 500 versus about 115 something. So that's shifter. Uh, any pause we need, any questions? There's a question about recording. Yes, uh, we recorded, we have, it's being recorded and I'll pr process it before we upload it. Slides will be available quickly after this class is, uh, is done. So Heather, there is a question being typed right now, so. <laughs> <laughs> I'll continue and then go, go back to that. Yes. So Python, Python becomes much more um, popular um, like compared to 10 years ago. Python has all these libraries um, that people are using data processing. Python can be used for machine learning, deep learning. So now it's fully supported in NERSC. We use Anaconda Python. Um, there's a Python page on using parameter, but uh, other than that, the things I want to talk about is applied to both Korean and parameter. So don't use user being Python, it's old. Use module load Python. It's much more updated. It's uh, maintained by NERSC and also it already includes basic packages, NumPy, SciPy, MPI for Py, for example. You could also make your own custom Python environment, module load Python and kind of create, give it name, Python version, kind of activate and then install your custom packages and then use it and then deactivate. So here's a page um, and a link to how to, how to run Python jobs at NERSC. There's much, much more details there, uh, different ways of using Python, using module, use your own custom version, and then um, how to run parallel. Um, it also has uh, something about how to run Python code in parallel. This is a page. <clears throat> So you have a few ways, there's multi-processing. For example, if your Python code um, low, calls some libraries like MKL, underneath and it'll use a number of threads available to do multi-processing. It's sort of like a black box. Um, then recently we have just configured PyOMP on, on Perimeter. It's not ready on Cori. There's a page on PyOMP. You could use some of the um, directives similar to OpenMP in C and Fortran, but you can use those in Python code. And with this PyOMP um, kind of environment, you have to uh, create following instructions there and then you're able to actually setting number of threads to run your OpenMP, PyOpenMP code. There's a task 
um, as a framework, you can cre create a group of workers that has its own scheduler to run on single or multiple or many nodes. Dask has its own visualization tools, so it's also useful for uh, parallel Python. Uh, MPI for Py definitely has MPI in it. Um, you have to install file instructions, the uh, Py for uh, MPI for Py, and it's <clears throat> best to use with Docker and container. But um, read the the instructions here and uh, Py for M MPI for Py on on GPU also uses CUDA where MPI, so it has more um, hooks in, in using it as well, but you can find the documentations. Um, the R Python support at NERS is, is excellent. <laughs> hey, Helen. Yes, question. Good question now, okay. Would you typically suggest that shifter images of a Python application would have better performance over um, CVMFS installation of the same application? Over CVMS. Uh, I don't have this knowledge uh, or quick answer for comparison, but for little bigger Python packages, especially in um, large um, jobs of Python number blanks, for example, the using shifter image is, is much better. I, I heard for Py for MPI, it's recommended to use shifter because the, the huge number of shared libraries uh, with, huge, uh, with the large number of ranks, it takes so long to, to uh, start up, to make them available on compute nodes. For, oh, actually I have a, I have a, pl a plot to quickly show you here. Uh, it's not CVMF, it's a temp FX. Mm. So CVFMS, I think, I believe it's already a shifter environment. So CVFMS is provided as a shifter environment. It's it's not on its own. So if you have, I'll take it to the um, Python support people and CVS support people to see if they have any comparison data. And I'll leave it um, the answer in the in the Google Doc. There is another one here in the chat that I pasted also in the Google Doc. Can we use a ray distributed library for running parallel Python code on NERSC CPUs and the GPUs? I think so. Yeah, I think Ray was one of the package framework here. Check the documentation. Please go on. Okay. So I just said Python and uh, yeah, talk about this. And Jupyter, uh, we're almost done talking. Then we have about half an hour to do the hands-on that as planned. Um, what is Jupyter? So I, I'm sure many people have used Jupyter in various um, occasions. It, it contains, it's a sort of notebook. You can create and share your documents. People using it for uh, live code equations, doing visualization, people are doing it in the training, and you can use notebook for uh, machine learning, deep learning, tutorials, all sorts of things, very popular. People are using Jupyter to log into our system without uh, command line logins as well too. Um, so here are the available Jupyter kernels. Um, besides the things available uh, provided by, um, you know, NERSC provided, you have, we have a Python kernel with Julia, lots of machine learning, deep learning, um, I think in the Python section, uh, I also talk about how you, oh no, I'm going to talk about, <laughs> you can also create your own kernels to be used in the Jupyter kernel. It's very similar to a setup uh, for the Python kernel environment, but except you, you're creating something especially for IPy kernel. So here's the instruction to build your own kernel to be used for, for Python. So you modulo to Python and then create, um, <clears throat> make sure you have IPy kernel plus all the other packages you want to install and kind of activate my um, ENV. And then you have another step to do, I, IPy kernel install dash dash user dash dash name. This is the name, my EN Jupyter is the one you're gonna see in the in um, Python, uh, in the Jupyter 
available kernels. As here, I have my my EN. It's, these are my own um, Jupyter kernels. So you could do make up those on your own as well. Um, so additional customization. What if you want much more complicated? For example, I want my kernel have uh, my some environment member set. I want my kernel to have a module being loaded, etc. For those cases, you could create a script first, helper script, and then <clears throat> I think I've uh, the uh, the this is a uh, Jupyter's uh, file, and then using this file, I have I, I think I'm missing a few lines here to use this file to create the Py IPy kernel. The, a few of the uh, steps are similar to um, the kind of create steps here, but using the file and using the uh, helper script. I'll add those uh, to the slide. Okay. And then when you log into Jupyter Hub, um, you will see as this, I'm using a train account here just to show you. Um, you see the parameter, you have shared CPU, exclusive GPU, and configurable GPU as you have a more custom settings for those. And Cori, by default, you have shared CPU. Um, and I actually, you should, normal users don't have this button here. This is for the Cori GPU access. You have to specially request for the Cori GPU access, then you will have this button. And you could also request for exclusive Cori CPU um, access, then you have another button here. Then you could just um, launch, uh, choose a start and choose your kernel and then just use the Jupyter notebook after that. Um, deep learning, machine learning um, stack. This is a big page, machine learning. <clears throat> Some of the big, so we had a survey, which framework tools are you using? Scikit-learn is part of Python. Then Kara, Keras, uh, TensorFlow and PyTorch. So we support all of these and with different, diff uh, training libraries, and we have um, them available in Jupyter and Shifter. So if you use uh, without not using Jupyter, then you module load a version and pip install, and you can install your own packages um, with Conda Create. And we have some pre-installed Jupyter kernels like these, um, like TensorFlow here, different versions, PyTorch, you can see that. And you can also use your own custom kernels, like uh, I mentioned for the Jupyter, how did you did those for, how we do this for so the Jupyter kernels. Right, we're right on time with half an hour hands on. More questions, please? Uh, let me check quickly here. Oh, there is one person typing right now. <laughs> okay, yeah, I'm sorry with pretty, very, very, very uh, compact um, presentation because normally we have a news or training, it could be like a, a day's worth of things. Uh, okay, so. this is the question, Helen. Can we run Rust code on Cori and, or Permuter? Rust, um, I'm not familiar with that, I'm sorry. I'll find out and um, answer that in the Q&A doc. All right, so then go ahead, Helen, please. Um, another um, recommendation is if you want to create a ticket, we could route to uh, the the more acknowledged uh, staff person, that uh, expert on uh, the data analysis. So we will be doing hands-on exercise today, being um, doing compiling and running jobs on Cori. So uh, if you have a NERSC account, make sure you have can do MFA um, logging. So SSH user at cori.nosc.gov. Uh, training account, just use your password. Um, the nurse account user use MFA to logging. Then I recommend you go to Scratch and then get clone and a CD to that directory. We have three exercise readme files you could follow. And we have a reservation today from 2 to 3.30. Uh, this um, half hour past that, the end time. You're free to leave at three, but if you have more questions, I'll be staying until 3.30 to answer any questions with also reservations still available. Um, so 
in the readme file, it does say so. Um, during reservation time, you, you would have these two flags. The reservation could, depends on whether you want to use a Haswell node or a kernel node. And everybody's in this um, project. Don't use your regular uh, NERSC project if you are a user because the reservation is only accessible from this account. We also have some uh, available batch scripts. You, in there, you could uh, as batch directly, but you uh, in the some of the, you could also use as alloc to do more experiments with these uh, affinity settings. You can see the results right away. So follow the readme, please, just and and let me know if you have any questions. 